attention of the world is focused upon Europe and the events which are transpiring there. In order that the public may be appraised the latest developments on the unsettled continent, Mutual brings you from time to time special transatlantic broadcasts. Tonight we present direct from Berlin, Germany, an up-to-the-minute commentary by Sigrid Schultz, correspondent for the Chicago Tribune and Mutual's representative in Berlin. For Miss Schultz broadcast, we now take you direct to Berlin, Germany. Mutual Broadcasting Company. Hello, Mutual Broadcasting Company. This is Sigrid Schultz, the Berlin correspondent of the Chicago Tribune, speaking from Berlin. In the same hotel, where six and eight years ago, members of the international press used to attend to talk with the leader of an important political party of Germany by the name of Adolf Hitler, the assembly began tonight to wait for the outcome of a historic meeting between this same Adolf Hitler, the absolute master of Germany today, and the emissary of the British Empire, the British ambassador to Berlin, Sir Neville Henderson. All day long, there had been two topics of conversation. When does Henderson arrive in Germany? And how big were the rations of food you managed to get from your grocer in Dayman? Yesterday, Henry was Sunday. The crowds opposite the Chancellor were dense. Today, though this is a historic day and the Germans knew it, they were much thinner. Many of the youth sensation seekers were out seeing that they could get some extra reserves before everything is rationed. In the Chancellery, activity had been carried on as usual. When we passed there this noon, we caught the letters of generals and admirals report to Adolf Hitler, the supreme command of all Germany's armed forces. General von Reichenau, the chief expert in military motorization, slipped in, while his monocle stuck to his eye at just the right angle. Hitler's personal adjutant, Schultz, his minister in the Chancellor, Richard Lummers, nearly passed by unnoticed, or to be accurate, unrecognized. They were wearing the field gray of the German army, instead of the uniforms in which one is accustomed to see them. The protector of Germany's new country provinces, Aaron von Nairach, arrived, as usual, a stately figure. The club cheered him. Some got their courage up and asked, Will we manage it, manage it once more, Mr. Minister? No, that merely smiled indulgently and moved on. The crowd continued its guessing and discussions about the problem of whether or not Hitler could enforce the return of Danzig to the Reich without bloodshed. Women and young girls listened feverishly watching the scene. I do not feel over, to a great extent, out of excitement. Red Cross nurses provided them with a glass of water and a few quietening pills, and the girls went on. Some decided it would be wiser to go home. The climax of the day was reached tonight, when in the bright floodlights of the Wilhelm Platz, the car and the third ambassador rolled up to the heavy brass doors of the Chancellery. In the court of honor, the guards of honor present arms. And Sir Neville Henderson, trying to look as unconcerned as a blase English gentleman should, looked at the Chancellery with a British message, on which everybody in Berlin believed the immediate future of Europe depends. He was received by Hitler in the presence of Hitler's foreign minister, Hafen Ribbentrop. The conversation lasted for almost an hour and a half. The longer it lasted, the more pleased the German officials waiting in the historic hotel across the street where the press became. Occasionally, one or the other of them would slip out across the street and get in touch with some friend hidden in the vestments of the chancery or possibly in one of the ministries nearby. Every time they came back from their serious calls, they would claim to be more satisfied with the outlook. They would say, a door had been left open for negotiations. That was the first report. Then they'd have another glass of beer, another leg of roast partridge that has just come into season, a few more spoonsful of sauerkraut with pineapple and mashed potatoes, and another would come in and report what he had dreamed. He would say, the way things are going, we think we can now look forward to the proclamation of the union between the Reich, between the Bensage and Germany in a very short time, maybe tomorrow. Later in the evening, after the official bulletin about Sir Neville Henderson's visit to Herr Hitler became known, it was learned that the Germans from the, what they called, oral statements of Sir Neville Henderson made it quite clear that there is some possibility to negotiate. Germans whom I have found to be very well informed in quite a number of years declared that in the course of the conversation, Hitler immediately answered some of the questions presented to him by Henderson for Mr. Chamberlain. Rumor has that Sir Neville Henderson himself would immediately fly back to Hitler to London with Hitler's answers. 
This was shown to be untrue. The representative of the British government, Mr. Boyle, who had arrived with a British ambassador, intends to fly to London early tomorrow morning, the same government plane, and he and he arrived. This will enable him to give the answers of Herr Hitler to Chamberlain, who can then use them as basis of talks in the British chamber. And again, negotiations can be resumed. A further cause for optimism in the eyes of Germans tonight is what they call the abating of the acts of post terrorists against the German population in Poland today. This, I believe, indicates that the Poles are trying to prepare the atmosphere for negotiations with the Germans. In the Berlin restaurants and coffee houses, rumors were flying round that the Polish Prime Minister Beck would be coming to Berlin tomorrow or in the very near future. This rumor lacks foundations. They, should, they show how optimistic the masses are. Only the women were less optimistic. They rushed to their groceries and their dairymen early this morning with their brand new ration cards. They found that of the two ounces of coffee which they are allowed per head of the family, two-thirds are for coffee substitutes. If you know how fond the German housefrau is of her coffee, you will realize she was definitely worried. Despite the shopping fever, fever, most men were busy discussing the international situation, and you could hear many forecasts about the tremendous role Russia, the Soviets, would soon play in Central Europe, both from an economic and a political viewpoint, as well as a military viewpoint. Now others, who are close to England, declare most emphatically that negotiations for a wider economic cooperation between England and Germany progress so far that when the friction due to Poland stops, a big business boom should be expected for all concerned. France figures less prominently in the discussions, despite the publication of Mr. Daladis and Herr Hitler's letters. But tonight, official quarters were quite worried about a statement issued by the official news agency in France. They feared that Hitler might vent some of its contents. But this worry was not taken seriously. Now I return you to America.